Okay, John chapter 9. So we finally finished John chapter 8. Took a few weeks to get chapter 8 finished, but we're done chapter 8 now, on to chapter 9. And just like a few of the other chapters that we've read here now, um, John chapter 9 is all one incident. It all goes together. Um, in fact, once we get about halfway, not even halfway into this chapter, we're just going to kind of fly through a lot of this because it's just the same story and we just got to kind of keep reading and keep um, seeing what's going to happen next. Uh, so we'll take a little bit of time here at the beginning, especially to make sure we understand what's going on here. But later in the second half of the chapter, we're just kind of going to read it and see how it goes from there. Um, but a pretty famous story, I think, Jesus's encounter um, with a person that's blind. Um, what's interesting here in this chapter, though, is that for the whole middle part of it, Jesus disappears. Um, that didn't, didn't occur to me until yesterday when we were talking about it in Bible study at Redeemer that for most of this chapter, Jesus is not in the picture. Um, you don't get very many verses in John or in any of the other gospels where Jesus isn't front and center, but he's not here for a little while. He's, the, the action's going on with Jesus somewhere else, uh, but then he comes back at the end and everything comes full circle. But uh, we'll get to all of that as we go. I think the best thing to do is for us just to start reading here. So let's start uh, with John chapter nine. Uh, verse 1 and 2, it's the first paragraph there. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Okay. So the first thing we find out here is that Jesus is coming along, walking along, and he sees this man who's blind from birth. Now, before this, before you know, doing some reading to get ready for Bible study here, it had never really occurred to me what's the big deal about the fact that he was blind from birth. You, know, you hear a bunch of stories in the Gospels about um, Jesus healing blind people. This is not the only time this happened, but this is the only time a big deal is made out of the fact that he was born that way, right? Um, and so there's some significant there's some significance to that. Like what's what's the significance of the fact that he was born that way, right? And so one of these church father guys had kind of a helpful thing that I think can, can get us to see the importance of this here. And it's an, an inter interesting thing too. We'll I'll get to that in a second. So this guy, his name is Ambrose of Milan. All bottom of the screen is cut off there, but I don't know how to fix that. That's okay. um, he says, there's a kind of blindness usually brought on by serious illness, which obscures one's vision, but that can be cured. So he said, sometimes people get sick it causes them to go blind. He says, but it's possible that a doctor might be able to cure that, okay? And he's living back in the 300s and he's saying, look, it's possible that maybe could be cured, okay? But then he says, um, and there's another sort of blind blindness caused by a cataract, right? We're all familiar with how this works, right? But look what he says, this is amazing. That can be remedied by a surgeon back then. In the 300s, he's saying, look, we can, even back then, he's saying they can do surgery. If you've got a cataract, the doctor can get that off of there. Is that true? Yeah, I looked it up, actually. <laughs> yeah. Could you imagine the procedure compared to today? Because I think now it's all lasers. Yeah, no, I know. I looked up. <laughs> I, 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 I read this. Because like, this, this is just a book written by this guy, right? And so he, he's Ambrose of Milan's not got any reason to lie about it, right? He's... Say it. He's, he, he, well, he, he's, he's just talking about what they do, and they could do cataract surgeries back then, right? Um, but like Leah said, it's not anything like a cataract surgery today. So I looked it up in like a medical journal and found out, yeah, all the way back then they used to do cataract surgery. Um, it, it was a, a rather gruesome process, however, and they, they, what they would do is they take like a, a needle or a sharp thing and scrape the cataract to the side. They wouldn't take it off of your eye. They would push it over and it would be on your eyeball just on the other part, right? And, and I, I found this, uh, this is just incredible. <laughs> A really old like painting type thing of some guy having this done. <laughs> Get, getting his eye scraped. And I guess what, what I read about is that it, 
initially it would work really well. The immediate results of the surgery would be excellent. You would immediately regain your sight, right? But then very often it would result in permanent blindness. <laughs> so it wasn't necessarily worth it, right? Like it, it maybe worked out for a little while, but then you ended up going completely blind and there was no hope for you anymore. <laughs> Anyways, I, I, when I first read that, all of this, I was floored. I had never imagined in a million years that they had cataract surgeries way back then, but apparently they did. And even now, it's only been the last how many years you hear about cataracts. Mm. Yeah, but already back then they knew about it. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Okay, but his point here is that there's these, he says there's these different kinds of blindness. And some of these other kinds, doctors can fix. Okay. And then he says, but then compare that to this guy here. He's born blind. Right? So it's not from a sickness. It's not from a cataract. He was born that way. See, so now he says, draw your own conclusion. This man who was actually born blind was not cured by surgical skill, but by the power of God, right? And so he's saying the reason why John's making such a big deal of telling us the guy was born that way was that doctors could sometimes cure blind people, but no doctor had ever cured a person who had been born blind. Because there, it, it wasn't like there was just some sickness in their eyes or something like that. They, their eyes had never worked. There's something wrong. There's just something. It's not something a doctor can fix. But here it's going to get fixed. And it shows you Jesus isn't just some highfalutin doctor with a needle scraping cataracts off people's eyes. Right? He, he's, he's God healing people. Right? And so he says that's the significance of the guy being born. Being born blind. Even today, if you, if you think about that, a person born blind is off, off, often because of like a genetic abnormality yeah. or something like that. Mm -hmm. And medically, there's a lot we can do today, but, but it's all technologically based and outside of the person, whereas Jesus actually healing a person born blind goes down to the genetic structure. Yeah, yeah, true. And, true. and healing that genetic. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to that more, more of that kind of thing in a minute. The other thing too, though, and this is this only occurred to me a few years ago. Another pastor pointed this out to me because you get lots, like I said, there's lots of other times in the Bible Jesus heals a blind guy, but then sometimes you hear things like um, the, the Jesus is going to heal a blind guy, and the blind guy comes and like walks up to him, and you're like, well, how did he get there? He's blind, right? But then when you need to also remember is that in those in those days. What was considered blindness isn't necessarily what we consider blindness. Nobody had these, right? So people who just couldn't see very well would have been considered blind, but they could have still walked up to Jesus, right? Carefully, right? But they still had some ability to see, right? This guy is not like that, right? He doesn't walk up to Jesus. Jesus walks up to him. He's been born blind. He's never been able to see a day in his life, right? So you got, it, but that was like, that was a revelation to me too. When you know, a pastor told me that one time, well, that guy probably could actually see. He was just, he needed glasses, but such a thing didn't exist, right? Um, anyways, this guy is born blind. He's never seen a thing in his life. That's, that's what we've, the situation that we've got here. Um, and when Jesus sees this guy and stops and is going to eventually as we're going to see heal this guy before that happens his disciples um have a question what is their what is the question the disciples have sin. Man this man who is failing who sinned to make him like this that's their that's what they that's their question who, who sinned to make him like this right um now Whenever I've read this question from them before, I did, I've always just thought, you know, how can they be so dense, yeah. right? Don't they get it? But uh, again, after doing some reading this past week, I think there's good, there's a reasonable explanation for why they're asking this. It's still, they're still misguided in their thinking, but I've come to understand, I think a little bit better why they're asking this question. So this guy, St. John Chrysostom says, they were led to ask this question because our Lord had said above 
And he means all the way back in John chapter five, when he healed the paralytic, see, you are well, sin no more. So he had said that to the paralyzed guy after he healed him. See, you're better, sin no more. The disciples had heard that and said, oh, the guy was paralyzed because of his sin. Now Jesus has healed him and he shouldn't go sin again. Now, that's not what Jesus actually said. Jesus didn't say, you were paralyzed because of your sin. Now don't go sin anymore. Jesus healed him and said, now don't go sin more, right? He never said that first part, that you're paral you were paralyzed because of your sin. They've, they, they, they think they've made the connection there and understood why that guy was paralyzed. And so now here they're encountering another guy who has some kind of disability, and they're saying, well, if the guy with the paralyzed guy was paralyzed because of his sin, then this guy must be paralyzed because of his sin. But what's the problem with that? How, wh why, why would it be a problem for him to be blind because of his own sin? How long has he been blind? Since birth. Since birth. Like, yeah. what, what, what in the world could he have done to do that? So they take the next step and say, well, if it wasn't him, then it must have been his parents. Right? So they are actually making sense, right? They're not just dense. They're wrong because they've misunderstood something that Jesus said four chapters ago, right? So he says, thinking uh, from this, that the man had been paralyzed because of his sins, they say that other person was paralyzed because of his sins. But what would you say about this man? Had he sinned? How can you say that since he was blind from birth? Have his parents sinned, Right? This is what's all swirling around in their heads, okay? They're wrong, and the way we would say this in, like, logical terms is they're starting with what we call a faulty premise, right? They got a, the wrong starting point. Their premise, their starting point, is that the paralyzed guy was paralyzed because he sinned, and that's what Jesus said. Not what Jesus said, but that's what they understood, and so they're making conclusions based off of their understanding. Jesus is going to correct their whole understanding here in just a second. Right? Um, and I found this interesting too. This guy, Theodore of Mopsuestia, he thinks that it's a good question that they're asking. Okay? He says, it was not unusual for his disciples to ask this kind of question about all that was happening to the Lord so that they could learn those things that lead to godliness. He says, it's good. They need to learn these things. So it's better to ask and get the answer than to keep it to yourself and always wonder, right? Same thing applies in Bible study. It's better to ask and just let's, answer, let's see if we can get the answer to the question than to just not ever ask and always just wonder, right? He says, they were upset in their human way about this fact in trying to relate it to their faith. So they're trying to tie together their faith in Jesus and what they know from him and what they're seeing in the world and they're trying to bring these things together and it's not adding up for them so they ask Jesus about it and that's a good thing to do right we're trying to bring what we believe and what we know going on in the world together when we talk about it in bible study you can ask questions and we'll answer right? what's that I, I don't mind for a second no i don't mind for a second sure
you can say about anything. Yeah. But even even as Esther and I talk in the morning, everything is in the Lord's hand, right? We're trusting in Him. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. And that's everything. Mm -hmm. Right, that would be the ideal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's easier said than done, but that's what that is what Jesus says. Yeah, yeah. So that's what that. So when I'm thinking like that, that's not inaccurate. No, no, no. I don't think so. Not at all. Okay, so that's their question. Who sinned, this guy or his parents, that he would be born like this? Um, like I said, if they're starting from a bad <coughs> premise, a faulty starting point, um, and Jesus is going to correct them here right away. Uh, so let's read the next paragraph, verse 3 down to verse 5. <laughs> We must do the work of the things we claim. Rain is coming and so on. Wait, now I am in the next All right, thank you, Murray. So, what is did the, the, the disciples say? Who sinned, this guy or his parents, that he was born blind? What's Jesus' answer? Neither. Neither. Mm -hmm. Right? That's not. That's not what caused this to happen. Instead, what does he say is the reason why this guy was born blind? Yeah, to show the works of God in this man's life, right? So it's not because this guy sinned or because his parents sinned, but so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, the first thing we need to say is, well, does that mean that this guy and his parents never sinned? No, of course not, okay? So this guy, St. Augustine, he addresses this. He says, was he then born without original sin, which is like this disease, this condition we all have ever since Adam and Eve, okay? Or has he committed no sin in the course of his lifetime? No. Uh, both this man and his parents had sinned. But that sin itself was not the reason why <coughs> he was born blind. Karma is not a thing. Okay, that's, that's basically what the disciples were kind of like believing in here, right? Karma, as you hear about that sometimes, right? You, you do bad things, bad things happen to you. That's the principle of karma. And there are some religions where that's a fundamental part of what they believe, like in Hinduism and stuff like that, right? God doesn't work that way. And you read all the way through the Bible and you'll never find any instance where there's some rule of karma where you get what you deserve or something like that. You know, you do one particular bad sin and that bad thing is going to happen to you as a result um, or something like that. There is that sometimes, but there's no universal rule about it that says it's always going to work that way because it just doesn't. And there's a lot of other reasons why bad things happen to people other than just because they did something wrong. Okay. And this guy, um, Gregory the Great, who was one of the, the last good popes, um, he wrote a really helpful thing here that for us to think about, well, why do bad things like this happen to people, right? Um, and so he says, um, one blow, and that's what he means like when he talks, like, he means like a blow, like a bad thing happening to you, like being hit with something, right? One blow falls on the sinner for punishment only, not conversion. So he says, sure, sometimes bad things happen to people because they did something wrong and it's a direct consequence of what they did, right? The best example I, the example I usually use for that is if someone drinks too much, hops in their car and starts driving and totals their car and ends up laying in a hospital bed. That is a direct result of what they did, right? And yes, they can see it as the punishment, the consequence of their sinful behavior, right? There's a one-to-one -one connection, right? So he says, sometimes that happens. The bad thing happens to someone as punishment. And that's just the way it goes. Okay. Sometimes it's that. Another, another blow or another bad thing, he says, occurs for correction. Right? <laughs> to, to, to direct or guide someone into something better. Right. Still another happens, not in order to correct past sins, but for the prevention of future sins. 
But he says, look, sometimes God lets things, bad things happen to you to stop you from sinning some way in the future, right? It's, he, he uses this as a, as, as a way to stop you from sinning somehow. And then he says, another blow or more bad things happens neither for correcting past nor preventing future sins. Rather, the unexpected deliverance following the blows, following the bad things, serves to excite a love more focused on the Savior's goodness. And that last one is what we're talking about here. So he says, sometimes bad things happen not to punish your sins, not to correct you, not to prevent you from sinning, but just to make you love Jesus more. Right? Sometimes bad things happen to make you love Jesus more when he comes and saves you from it. And that's what we got here. Right? This man wasn't born blind because of his sins or because of his parents' sins or to prevent him from sinning in the future or anything like that. This guy was born blind so that one day Jesus could come along and open his eyes and this man could believe in Jesus as a result and then we could believe in Jesus as a result. Right? So sometimes he said, look, these, these terrible things happen to give you this love for Jesus who saved you. Right? Now, having gone through all those different reasons why maybe bad things might happen to people, we got to come back and kind of rewind a little bit here and, and look at what this guy, Cyril of Alexandria, says, because he says, concerning such matters, we should piously acknowledge that there are certain wondrous things that God alone understands. And so it's great to have all these reasons say, look, there's these reasons why bad things happen in the, to people sometimes. Right? But that doesn't mean that we always know exactly which one is going on here, right? Or that every time a bad thing happens, we should be able to figure out, well, why is God doing this? No, it doesn't work like that, right? This is what he's saying here. There are certain wondrous things that God alone understands, and we got to recognize it's not our business. If God wanted us to know, he would tell us, right? But it's helpful to know that there are such reasons, and we can think about what they might be, but there's no guarantee that we know exactly what they are. So we got to recognize our spot. We're not God. He's God. We're the clay. He's the potter. He's the one who makes things. He's the one who shapes our lives. We just got to trust that whatever he's doing here is good. We don't understand all the reasons or all the purposes or everything like that. Right? Am I making sense? Okay. Um, okay. So it's not because this guy sinned or his parents that he was born blind but so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Um, and, but then Jesus doesn't stop talking there. Then in verse 4 and on into verse 5, he says this kind of curious thing about it being um, daytime. He says, as long as it is, it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And so Jesus is saying basically here, there, there's work for us to do right now. You know, and again, this guy, Cyril of Alexandria says, uh, he kind of paraphrases Jesus a little bit here. And he says, this is like what Jesus is saying. He says, do you, why do you ask such questions that are better left unsaid? And it's funny, the one guy two slides ago said, they were asking a good question. It was good they asked. Now he says, oh, that's a question better left unsaid. They shouldn't have bothered, you know? Different people have different ideas here. Um, but he says, it's not the time for such curiosity, but for intense work. And I like what he's getting at here because the disciples have looked at a blind guy who obviously needs help. And rather than their first reaction being, how can we help this guy? Their first reaction is to be curious about how he ended up like this, right? And what's that? And that's not actually helpful to anybody, right? So, and that's a, that's something for us too. When we think about well, why we, we get we can fall into trap of thinking about why is there evil happening in the world? Why is there bad stuff out there in the world? And we spend so much time thinking about why is that out there in the world that we forget to actually do anything to help about what's going on out there in the world, right? Like what our speculating doesn't do anybody any good. Right? And if we're so busy just speculating about why these things are going on, what good are we to anybody? We're just sitting here spinning tires in our own brains. Right? And so that's kind of what Jesus is getting at here. He's pushing them past 
speculating and well let's do something about it right is what he wants to do now okay um so let, let's do something and he says we got, if we're going to do something we got to do something while it's daytime now jesus isn't talking about like actual night and day when the sun rises and sets um what does jesus say about how long the day is going to last As long as he's with us, yeah. He says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world, right? And so if he's here, the day is still going, right? And it's time to do work, right? And here's the really beautiful thing. I'm going to skip over that slide for a second here and come to this one. He's still with us, right? It would be tempting to say Jesus ascended into heaven. That means it's nighttime now. The day is over. No, because look what he said. This is this guy, St. Augustine. The day of Christ's presence will last to the end of the world. For he himself has said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Right? So it's still daytime. The sun is still shining. Jesus is the light of the world, and he's still here with us. It's time for working. Right? The time will come when it's nighttime and the working stops. Right? That'll, come, that'll happen when Jesus comes again, and it's not going to be time for working anymore. But for now... It's time for us to be working. There's stuff for us to do, right? Jesus is with us. The light is here. It's daytime. He says, let's get to work, okay? Um, but eventually the nighttime will come. And um, again, this guy, St. Augustine, I think he, he, he got me thinking with this one. Um, and he says, well, what is this nighttime, right? And what, what, what's that all about? So he says, every unbeliever, someone who doesn't have faith in Jesus, when he dies, is received into that night. There is no work to be done there. And that's not good, right? <laughs> People are meant to be busy doing stuff, right? Okay. And he uses, he uses the example here um, of the story Jesus tells in Luke chapter 16 of the rich man and Lazarus. Remember the rich man who feasts sumptuously every day in his great big house and Lazarus, the poor guy with sores all over his body who lays out at the gate getting licked by the dogs, okay? And then they both die and Lazarus goes into heaven to be with the Lord and the rich guy goes to torment in hell, okay? Remember that story? We had it in church just a few weeks ago, a month ago. That was my favorite story. That right. Was a child. Yeah, yeah. And that... And so that rich guy, uh, let, let me read here. So he says, in that night was the rich man, mm -hmm. right? He's died as an unbeliever, right? And now he's gone to the night where there's no work to do. Um, and asking for a drop of water from the bank uh, was, uh, was the rich man burning and asking for a drop of water from the beggar's finger. Unhappy man, when you were living, that was the time for work. And so it took me a little bit to kind of wrap my head around what St. Augustine was trying to say here, but I think it's really actually quite incredible. What you got to think about is, so the, the rich man, once he's down there in torment, he asks Abraham to send Lazarus to come, you know, dip his finger in water and put it on my tongue. And Abraham says, no, we can't do that. Then the rich man asks Abraham for something else. Do you remember what he asks for next? The gold on it. His Send Lazarus to my brothers to warn them. Now, this is incredible. For the first time in that guy's life, now that he's dead, he's thinking about someone other than himself. He'd been living for years in a great big house with a poor guy out at his gate getting licked by dogs. And he never once thought to go do anything for Lazarus ever. But now, now that he's died and he's in torment, now for the first time in his life, he's thinking about someone else. Not till after, he's still thinking about himself first, right? The first thing was send Lazarus down here to cool off my tongue. And when that wasn't possible, then he's thinking about someone else. But what does Abraham say? Does he send Lazarus back to go warn the brothers? No. The time for that, he basically says to, Abe, to the rich guy, was when you were still alive. That was the time for working. That was the time when you should have been caring about other people. Right? Now it's nighttime. That time's passed. Right? That time's 
that time was over, right? So this guy was living his life for himself in the daytime and finally wakes up in the nighttime, but it's, it's too late, too late, right? And Abraham says, well, your brothers are going to have to hear about it from the Bible. Right? That they should read the scriptures and know these things. It could be like things now. People that don't believe, they think when they die, that's it. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's nothing yeah. Yeah. after. Yeah. And it could have been the same with the rich man, and it wasn't until he died, and he was in hell, yeah. and realized there is a heaven and a hell. Yeah, and now he wants to try and do and something about it. Something. Yeah, and that's and that's the point that Jesus is making here. That like you're yeah, absolutely. Once once you're there, it's too late for you to do something about it now. Right? The time to do the work was in the daytime when the light was shining, right? Still when you were living, right? And now it's now now it's not. And that in that par in that parable, I'm gonna remember when Jesus is telling that whole story, it's a parable. Right, it's not like that. Jesus is telling us this is actually how it is, and there's these conversations flying back and forth between heaven and hell, and all this kind of stuff. Just a story, but the, that's that's the point of the story is that, yeah, well, at, at the, the time for you to care about those other people is right now, right, right now. Yeah. Okay, any other thoughts or questions about that? Then let's read a little bit more here. Get to the actual miracle. Um, uh, John chapter 9, verse 6 down to verse 7. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with his saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed. And came home seeing. Okay. Now we get to the actual miracle. Yeah. And Jesus does it in a pretty curious way, doesn't he? Yeah. We this, like I said earlier, this is not the only time Jesus heals a blind guy. And he doesn't do this every time, right? If Jesus wanted to, he could just say so, right? And the guy would be able to see, right? And it would just be done. So we got to ask ourselves, why is Jesus doing it this way? Why is he spitting on the ground? Why is he using mud? Why is he sending this guy to go wash in some pool called Siloam? Any, uh, any hypotheses? Any ideas? Yeah, well, because, yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus, and he does that on other, other times too, where Jesus is very intentional about using very concrete physical things, right? Well, for example, when he heals a, a deaf man, the one time he walks up to him and literally shoves his fingers into his ears and then touches his mouth and touches the guy's mouth to loosen his tongue so that he can talk, right? Um, and, and all kinds of times like that where Jesus is really physical, including you know, washing us with actual water in our holy baptism and feeding us with actual bread and wine with his body and blood in holy communion, right? Real physical things to make sure we get it, right? So yeah, he, there's definitely that's a part of it. Yeah. Man was created from the dust of the earth. Yeah, yeah. And that gets right to the heart of the answer. Where did people come from in the beginning, right? Yeah. So look at this guy, uh, Irenaeus of Lyon, um, really old. All the way back to 130 AD. He had healed others by a word, but the Lord bestowed sight on the one who was blind from birth, not by a word, but by an outward action. He did it this way in order to show that it was the same hand of God here that had also formed man at the beginning. Right? Go back to Genesis chapter one, God makes people, and, he, and it says, God formed the man out of the dust of the ground, out of the dirt, right? So Jesus goes back and uses the same raw materials that he had used at the very beginning to make people to remake this man's eyes, right? Which obviously were defective, right? And so it's the same hand who created people in the beginning using the same material that he used way back then 
to restore his creation, right? It's a big picture Bible thing where things kind of come full circle all of a sudden, right? Same hand, same stuff, um, recreating um, what wasn't quite right, what was wrong, what was broken. Yeah. There's something else. I, oh, and that's why if you look back at um, verse 3, when Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sin, but this happened so that the work of God creation might be displayed in his life. I'm going to show you how I made people, and I'm going to do it right now by putting mud on this guy's eyes. Okay, so that's why, that's why the mud. But then here's another question. Why the saliva? This is the gross part of it, right? Like, he makes mud by spitting on the ground. Like, why couldn't he, like, there's got to be someone's got some water around here, pour that on the ground, make a little mud, but nope. Jesus has to use his own spit. So why did he do that? Um, John Chrysostom, St. John Chrysostom gives us an answer to that. He says, and why didn't he use water instead of saliva for the clay? He says, he was about to send the man to Silo. In order, therefore, that nothing might be ascribed to the fountain, but that you might learn that the power proceeds from his mouth. Right? If he was going to send this guy to the pool to go wash, there would have been plenty of water there, right? But he didn't want anybody thinking that this was somehow a magical healing that came from the water. Remember that pool that all the people were at in John chapter 5 where the paralyzed guy was? What did the people think about the water? That he would heal them, right? It didn't really work, right? Jesus showed up and healed somebody in there, right? But now he's like, well, if I just send this guy to the pool to go wash, they're going to think, oh, a new magical pool, right? No. Nope. The power doesn't come from the water. The power comes from the mouth of Jesus, right? Just like we say, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So it's what comes from the mouth of Jesus is what actually is healing this guy. It's not even the dirt that's doing it, right? It's Jesus using the dirt and the water and all this kind of stuff. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, now there's one more question. Why send him to the pool, right? Jesus could put the mud on this guy's eyes, right? And then scrape it off and, oh, look, he's healed. Or get a jug of water and wash it off right there. But no, he sends him away to go walk to this pool with mud on his eyes. He's still blind, right? So someone's going to take him by the hand, right? And lead him off to the pool. And everyone's going to see this guy walking around with mud on his face and it's going to be quite a, quite a thing. So why bother sending him all the way to the pool? Well, again, St. John Chrysostom gives us a pretty good answer. He says, why didn't he have him wash immediately instead of sending him to Siloam? For one thing, everyone would probably see him as he was leaving, having the clay upon his eyes. The strangeness of this spectacle would most likely focus the attention of everyone on him. So Jesus is making, doing this to make it really public, right? And sometimes we have Jesus hiding things away and doing miracles in secret. But in this case, this is not being done in secret. Jesus is intentionally making this a very public affair by sending this guy to go walk over to the pool. And you can imagine that everybody who was around there and heard Jesus say that walked with him to the pool to see what would happen when he washed, right? What's going to happen? Is he going to be able to see or not? And then everybody along the way who saw this guy walking along is saying, well, what's going on here? And everyone's like, oh, Jesus told him to go wash in the pool. We're going to see what happens. You know, and the crowd just kind of swells around him as they go to this pool. And then all of a sudden he washes and he can see, and all this crowd witnessed it, bang, right there, right? So Jesus is making a public display. This is very intentional by Jesus to make this a miracle that everybody knows about. And he's not hiding this from anyone at all, which is a big deal because he's doing it in Jerusalem where the religious leaders all hate him. It's going to come up here in a second. Thoughts or questions about that? Yeah. I think also he's having a, a personal thing with this man and, and he's not We'll get more. Yeah, you're on to something. We'll get to that in just a second. 
Yeah, good point. Any other? So why did he keep the entrance to the pool? And then he could say if the water in the pool to the house. Mm, they could have, they could have, but everyone had heard Jesus tell him to go wash in the pool. And I think there's, um, and Jesus had put the stuff on his eyes. So I think there's immediately this connection between what's going to happen and what Jesus said, right? And so even if they thought that the water was somehow responsible, it was still Jesus who told them to go there. Right. And so Jesus, the, 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 the walk from wherever Jesus and this guy happened to be over to the pool, just as this opportunity for more and more and more people to get joined in to what's about to happen. Right. As the crowd kind of swells until they get there and then they see it happen. And I'm sure some people thought it was the pool, but they got eventually they're going to tie it back to. But Jesus is the one who told them to go in. But I think the bigger reason why Jesus does this is the baptism thing, um, like Diana was saying. So this guy, Ambrose of Milan, he says, yeah, this is about baptism. That's why he has to go to this pool and wash. He says, let Christ wash you, and then you will see, or, or then will you see. This is like, look, this is what, this is what happens in your baptism. You're, you're not physically blind, but when you are baptized, Jesus is opening up your eyes. Think about when um, Paul, you know, was making his way down to Damascus to go arrest people. Jesus stops him on the road, strikes him blind. Paul lives in Damascus for three days, unable to see, right? So Jesus sends a guy named Ananias to come baptize Paul. And immediately it says something like scales fall from Paul's eyes and he can see again, right? It's a, it's a thing. You're, you know, with baptism and your eyes being open. And for us, it's not our physical eyes because they work okay. Might need glasses, but other than that, they're okay. Um, but it's our, it's the eyes of faith that are being opened up through baptism, right? So he says, "Let Christ wash you, and you will, and then, and will, and you will then see." Oh, there's a typo there. Um, Come and be baptized. It is time. Come quickly, and you too will be able to say, "I went and washed," and you will be able to say, "I was blind." And now I can see. Now, this guy, Ambrose, he's living in a time when people had a bad habit back in those days of waiting to get baptized until they were about to die. This was their, their, their thing. They were all afraid that they would get baptized. And then after their baptism, they would sin. And that their baptism, they thought, wouldn't cover their sins after they bat were baptized. They thought it was a baptism only worked for the sins before you get baptized and not the ones after. They're wrong about that, but they, that's how they thought, and so they'd wait until they were right about to die in order to get baptized, but pastors like Ambrose were like, stop doing that, people. It's nuts, right? You, we, you don't know if the pastor's going to get there before you die. You don't know when you're going to die. You can't plan it like that. He's, so he's urging people here, get baptized. Look, and then what happened to that blind man will happen to you. Jesus will open the eyes of your faith to see and to believe, right? So he's urging people to go get baptized. Um, and this guy, Ephraim the Syrian, he makes this baptism connection too, but in a different kind of way. So he says, it was not the pool of Siloam that opened the eyes of the blind man. It was the Lord's command that affected it, right? It's Jesus's word. And a blind people could have gone and washed in that pool all they wanted. It wouldn't have done anybody any good unless Jesus had said, do this, and then you'll be able to see, right? And he says, so too, it is not the water of our baptism which cleanses us. It's not the water. Rather, it is the name pronounced over it, right? The words that we say in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's what takes the water and turns it into a baptism, right? We don't have holy water that magically washes away your sins. We have water with God's word, which makes a baptism, right? Same thing here. You have water with Jesus's words that opens the eyes of a blind, right? Making sense? Okay. Let's read a little bit further then. Um, John chapter 9, verse 8, down to verse 12. 
Children and those who had already seen him by this time. They had went to bed now, meaning to stretch and bed. Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. Now, how then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed. And then I could see, where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. All right, thank you, Diana. So now, now Jesus disappears out of the scene for a while. That's what I was saying before. Like Jesus isn't there for a long time now. We're going to have all the people trying to figure out what happened here. How did this guy get his sight back and what's going on? Um, the neighbors and those who had uh, lived around there or something like that, what do they, what do they think about the whole situation? Same man. Is this even the same guy? <laughs> I think for them, and this is kind of hard for me to understand. Because, like, look, he looks like he's got to look exactly the same, except his eyes are open now, right? Like, but I think the miracle is just so impossible for them to believe that in their brains they got say it's got this has got to be somebody who just looks like him or something like that. Like he's got some doppelganger twin brother that they didn't know about or something like that. I don't know. Um, but they think it's someone else. Um, uh, but the guy insists, no, it's me, it's me. Um, so what we're going to see here, this is something to keep your eye on, no pun intended, uh, as we work our way through this here. If we look at this guy who's not blind anymore, we're going to see how step by step along the way through this chapter, he's slowly but surely brought to faith in Jesus. You remember back to John chapter four when Jesus was talking with the Samaritan woman at the well? Remember that? Yeah. How step by step by step Jesus kind of brought her along. First of all, she just thought he was some weird guy who would have the nerve to talk to her at the well, right? And then she kind of realizes he's a prophet. And then she runs back into town and tells everyone, I think the Messiah is out there at the well, right? And then he announces to everybody, like, look, yeah, I am. Right, you bring me, they come along step by step by step by step. We're gonna have the exact same thing happen here. This guy's gonna come along step by step by step by step. In what we've read so far, what's his assessment of Jesus? And what Diana just read for us, what is what how does he describe Jesus? In verse 11. Man they call Jesus. Yeah, the man they call Jesus, which is a pretty underwhelming confession of faith, right? Not a lot there. Um, so uh, this guy, Cyril of Alexandria says, he appears still to be ignorant that the savior is by nature God. He hasn't figured that out. Mm -hmm. For otherwise he would not have spoke of him in such an unworthy way. Just called him the man called Jesus, right? There's not a lot there, okay? Mm -hmm. But as we'll see, eventually we'll get more uh, from this guy here. Um, uh, he'll, he'll grow in faith as we go. How does he know that Jesus made mud and put it on his eyes? Like he's blind? Yeah. He's never ha had sight to know what mud even was or felt like. Or... Yeah. Well, he's probably felt mud before, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so he probably felt that Jesus put something on his eyes and it was a mud-like substance. Someone might have also told him this is what he did, right? But notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say Jesus spat on the ground and made mud. He, might, he didn't see Jesus spit. He doesn't know that that's how Jesus made the mud. Um, but, uh, but he does know that it was mud because he's probably felt mud before and knows that, probably. But yeah, it, it is interesting what he does and doesn't know. I'm, I'm just having a moment of revelation or interest here um, because we talked about him going to the Pool of Siloam as... Um, kind of representative of, of baptism. Yep. And it's interesting because he doesn't even hardly know who Jesus is, but he had gone to the pool. And if you think of like baptism, like there are groups of people that think baptism has to be done when people understand why they're being baptized. But here we see that baptism is God's work yeah. that he gradually works through. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you, we could say that. We could, I, what's happening here isn't strictly speaking a baptism, no. so we can't make too much of a claim about that. But, Fair enough. But, we, but yes, we can say he got baptized even though he didn't understand everything. Yeah. Yeah, and understanding came later. Yeah. Yeah, we can say that. We got baptized, quotation marks. Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's read a little bit further here. 13 down to 17. Let's read that. They asked to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him, How in how had received his sight? The mud, he put mud on my eyes, the man replied. And I wash it now away. Oh, Some of the Pharisees said, The man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner do such miracles by him? So they were the lips divided. Finally, they returned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes to open. The man replied, he is a prophet. Okay. So now they bring they bring the guy to the Pharisees. Uh, and someone asked me yesterday, Redeemer, and this was a good question. Well, why did they bring him to the Pharisees? What are they, what's the reason for that? Right. Um, and I don't know, I I I've never read anything that anybody tried to explain why they would do that before, but I think the simplest explanation is a couple of things. One, the Pharisees were the the respected religious leaders of the day, and they wanted to get the, their assessment about what just happened, right? You know, and it was, they were just, they were respected authorities, and so they were people you talked to about these things. But the other thing, too, is I think just knowing human nature a little bit and what people are like, um, the people in Jerusalem there, they know that Jesus doesn't get along with the Pharisees, and the Pharisees don't get along with Jesus. And they like they want to stir the pot and see what happens, right? That, that, that's human nature, right? Like you have a chance, look, oh, Jesus just healed this guy, and guess what, everybody? It's the Sabbath. This will really tick off the Pharisees. Let's go let them know, right? And like let's see what kind of commotion we can cause. Like honestly, I think that's a big part of what's going on. This is people trying to make a mess, stir the pot. Yeah. Um, they want to see stuff hit the fan. And what's going to go? They want chaos, and that's what that's what they're trying to bring on. So they bring the guy to Jesus, um, and we find out finally it hasn't been mentioned until verse fourteen that it's the Sabbath, and we already know that's going to be a problem for the Pharisees, and we already know that Jesus doesn't really care. Um, but so the, the Pharisees have been out to get Jesus right from the beginning. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 This is not. This is nothing new for them. This is just another. This is another, just another reason to be angry at Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the Pharisees put him through the ringer and ask all the questions. Uh, the Pharisees, we find out, are kind of divided about Jesus, but we knew that already because one of the Pharisees is that guy, Nicodemus, who's already, we've already seen, he believes in Jesus at least a little bit, right? Um, so there's this division among the Pharisees because they see, like, how if he's, if, how can, if he's just a sinner, a bad guy, how can he do these amazing things, right? Um, so they finally just turn around and ask the God, the blind guy who isn't blind anymore, what do you think? And what does he say? He's a prophet. He's a prophet. Well, look at that already. We've made some progress, right? So we've gone from calling this guy the man named Jesus to calling him a prophet. Now that's a step in the right direction. Right? He's not all the way there yet. Right? So St. Augustine here says, he declares openly what he thinks, for he said, he is a prophet. He says, not yet anointed in heart. Right? He's, his, his eyes have been anointed with the mud right? and opened up so they can see, but his heart hasn't been opened up to believe in Jesus yet. Um, not, not yet anointed in heart. He could not confess the Son of God. Nevertheless, he is not wrong in what he says either. Right? Jesus is a prophet, but he's not just a prophet, right? Remember, this is exactly what the Samaritan woman at the well said. 
He said, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet, right? And Jesus doesn't say, no, I'm not. No, he said, you're right, but I got to take you a little farther still, right? And so this guy's got, but we got somewhere we got to get to still. He's not there yet, but he's on the way. What's interesting, though, this is what interests me here, is when that happened with the Samaritan woman at the well, it was Jesus standing there talking with her that brought her along, right? Jesus isn't standing here talking with this guy. Who's he talking with? Who's, who's the blind guy talking with? The Pharisees, with people who are opposed to Jesus. But Jesus is using those people who are opposed to him to bring this other guy along, right? Jesus isn't standing there talking to the guy, but Jesus is working behind the scenes, bringing this guy to faith in him while he's talking to Jesus's opponents, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus is doing so much more in this story and just in every day, in our everyday lives that we can even begin to understand. There's background stuff going on that's beyond our comprehension, right? So we've got some progress here in terms of this guy's faith. Let's read a little bit further, um, 18 down to 23. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind who had received his sight until he sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? He asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered. And we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who opens his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Okay, so now it gets weird. Okay. <laughs> The Pharisees don't like what this guy has been saying. And I think, and so in verse 18, it calls them the Jews. But we got to remember that's the religious leaders of the people of Israel, which includes the Pharisees. They're so against Jesus that they're absolutely convinced that this miracle must not have happened. That this must be a scam. This must be a conspiracy. They've gone straight into conspiracy theories now, right? So they bring in the parents and they say, is this even actually your son, right? Or is this like some doppelganger, right? Was he even actually born blind? Or have you been lying about that his whole life so that you could do this little switch, you know, right here when Jesus shows up, which is nuts, right? Like that doesn't even make any sense. But they're so desperate for what Jesus says or what Jesus has done to not be real that they're willing to believe anything other than believing Jesus, right? And so they come up with their own harebrained idea here. Um, well, how did the parents respond to all of this? Is he their son? He's, he's our son? Was he born blind? Yes. How is he able to see now? We don't know. Go talk to him. <laughs> and I, I, just, I just think this is, uh, oh, I'll skip over this one. I just think this is so funny here from this, from this guy, St. Augustine. He gets a little bit, uh, um, uh, well, witty about it here. He says, the parents reply, even though we know he's been blind from birth, we also know that he's been able to speak for some time now. <laughs> you know? Of course, their son is an adult, right? He's been able to speak for years. They're like, look, He's a, he's a grown man. Talk to him yourself. He couldn't see, but he's been able to talk his whole life. Go talk to him. Right? Now, the interesting thing here is the parents essentially throw their kid under the bus here, right? <laughs> like, they don't come out and try and help him or defend him at all, right? The, the parents are protecting themselves yeah. here, right? They're, it's a, John has told us here that, you know, the, the parents are afraid of the Jews because the Jews had decided that if anyone acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ, that he was the savior, that he'd be put out of the synagogue, which means 
that they would be kicked out of their church, essentially. Okay? And it wasn't like there was just another church around the corner that you could go to because they were all united. They were all together. Right? So if you got kicked out of one, you were kicked out of all. So they're afraid of getting kicked out of their church, their synagogue. And so they won't say anything. And they say, go talk to him. If he wants to get himself kicked out of church, he can get himself kicked out of church. We're not getting kicked out of church. Right? There's nothing even to pick down. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on the one level, he's an adult, so I guess they're saying he can take care of himself. Um, and it would, and it would, and it would have been, it would be a really bad thing uh, if you got kicked out of the of the synagogue because that wouldn't just have. It's not just a religious thing; it's a social thing. It's everything in your community. You got to imagine like small town where there's only one church and if you got kicked out of that church everyone knows you're the guy in town who got kicked out of church right no now nobody wants to even do business with you because of who you are so it's a it would be a really bad thing um but yeah they're they're thinking of themselves and not really even concerned about their own kid but what we're going to find out in a few minutes here too is that it's not actually such a bad thing to get kicked out of the synagogue not as bad as it seems because jesus is going to do something about that but that's that's in a, in a few minutes here. Okay, let's uh, let's keep reading a little bit further here. Like I said, once we get going here, we can kind of just zip through some of these verses. So let's read 24 down to 27. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? And then I go farther. No, nope, that's good, right there. So they bring... <laughs> The parents aren't giving him anything, so they bring back the, the blind guy. And then essentially there in verse 24, they put him under oath. Okay, like when they say, give glory to God, they're like, hey, no more lying. You're under oath now, like we would in a courthouse. You know, I swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God, whatever, right? So they, they're, they're like putting him under oath, and they say, we know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. They think they know that anyways, because he's been doing stuff on the Sabbath. For them, it's, look, he's a sinner. He's breaking the Sabbath, okay? Um, how does the guy respond to that? Does he think Jesus is a sinner? He doesn't know. So he's clearly not confessing Jesus to be the sinless son of God yet, right? Yeah. We're still alive. He's like, I don't know if he's a sinner or not, but he opened my eyes, I can see now, right? So he's still got some work to do here. So there's still some progress to be made. Um, and, then they, and, he's, and then they ask him again, how did he open your eyes? Uh, I love his response in verse 27. Do you want to become his disciples too? Um, right? Like, so now we're getting like little witty, sharp responses back and forth here. Um, but that, that, that what he says there indicates something. He says, do you want to become his disciples too? Which means he thinks of himself as a disciple of this Jesus prophet guy. Right? Now he hasn't come so far as to say he's the son of God, but he said he's a prophet. I'm his disciple now, okay? We're, gone. We're, we're working on it, right? We're getting there, okay? Now, any questions about any of that? Let's read a little bit further here. 28 down to 34. Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's, you are this fellow's disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. And when it says, when it says they threw him out, 
It doesn't mean they just kick them out of the whatever room they happen to be in. It means they kick them out of the synagogue, right? Like the parents were afraid of happening to them. It happened to the kid, right? He's out. Jesus isn't going to leave it like that. Well, I hold on to that for a second, okay? Um, so it gets pretty, it, it, it escalates really quickly here. Um, all kinds of things going back and forth. Um, but the one thing that I think is worth us taking some time to look at here is what this guy says in verse 31. He says, we know that God does not listen to sinners. Now, the thing we have to remember here is just because somebody in the Bible says something doesn't mean it's true. Okay? If God doesn't listen to sinners, then all of us are in a heck of a lot of trouble, and he's not listening to us. Okay? So one of these church father guys you know, helps is helpful here as he responds to that. This guy, Origen, says, how, if God did not hear a sinner, were the sinners taught to say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive our transgressors? Right? Whom then does God hear? He hears those who turn to him in repentance, even if they have not yet ceased from being sinners. Right? So what we have to remember here is the guy's wrong. He's, he's still on his way to coming to faith in Jesus. He's got a mixed up idea right now that God doesn't listen to sinful people. Which is not true. God does listen to sinful people because Jesus died and rose again to open up that channel of communication between us and God, right? He does listen to sinful people, but this guy doesn't get that yet. So just because he says God doesn't listen to sinners doesn't mean it's true, right? God does listen to sinners. He listens to the prayers of his people through his son, our Lord Jesus, right? Thoughts, questions about that? Just a thing in general to keep in mind when you're reading the Bible. Just because someone in the Bible says something doesn't mean it's true. The whole book of Job, you've got Job's three friends who are all wrong talking, and everything they say is wrong, but half of the book is filled with their words, and you have to realize what they're saying isn't true. It's the, problem. It's the difficulty in reading the book of Job, uh, and it's true here too. But look now, look at verse 34. Um, this whole thing had started with the disciples wondering who sinned, this guy or his parents, that he was born blind. That, in their mind, must have been how it worked. What do the Pharisees say about this guy when he was born in verse 34? He was steeped in sin. Steeped in sin at birth. So they're the ones who think you sin, bad things happen to you, right? So they're saying, like, no, you're the reason you were blind when you were born is because you were steeped in sin, soaked in it. That's why that happened to you, right? And they made that decision based on the fact that he was blind. So that's not how Christians think. That's how Pharisees think. So we don't say things like, you know, this sin is because, of, or this, this bad thing is because of that sin or something. That's not how we Thoughts or questions about any of that? Okay. We are going to finish the chapter here. <laughs> yeah, because it all goes together. So we may as well run right through. We're on to verse 35 now. We're going to read 35 down to 41. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this, and asked, what, are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin, but now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Okay. Here's the first thing we got to notice here. The guy gets kicked out of the synagogue. And what does Jesus do in verse 35? He finds it. Goes and finds him. Right? He gets kicked out of the synagogue. And it says, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he had found him, he said, right? Mm -hmm. So first thing, as soon as Jesus, oh, they kicked you out. I'm coming for you. 
right? Because you're not, I, I'm, I'm not kicking you out. I'm receiving you in, right? When the one sheep goes missing, Jesus, the good shepherd, goes looking for the one, and you can bet he finds his sheep, right? So there's the one that's lost, and Jesus just went and found him. Just like that. And I love how this, again, St. Augustine puts it here. He says, it was no disadvantage to be put out of the synagogue, since uh, the one they cast out, Christ received. Mm -hmm. Right? Get kicked out by them? Jesus welcomed me in. Welcome to the club. They kicked me out too, he says. You know? and, he, and he receives him in. So I think that's just a beautiful part of this story here, where the guy gets kicked out, and right away, there's Jesus. He hasn't been in the story since verse um, 7. But as soon as the guy is kicked out, Jesus is back. Right? Here he is. Okay? Um, and he says to him, do you believe in the Son of Man? Now, Jesus, is, the guy has been brought along slowly to faith in Jesus. He's still not there yet, though, right? Now, Jesus is here to finish the job. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the guy's like, well, who is he so that I can believe in him? And Jesus says, standing right in front of you. The one who's talking to you is the guy. And how does the guy respond in verse 38? Lord, I believe. Right? And when he calls Lord, Jesus Lord, he means Lord. Not just like sir or something like that. Lord. Like God standing right in front of him. And he, and he worships him right there. Right? So Jesus has just completed it. Brought this guy to faith now. He's got, he's got faith in Jesus. Now, verse 39. Jesus says, this is a tricky saying from Jesus. But I think that we can wrap our minds around it a bit here. Jesus says, for judgment I have come into this world so that... The blind uh, will see, and those who see will become blind. So Jesus is, we already know, well, he's opened the eyes of a blind guy, but he's saying, like, look, if you're not blind, you need to become blind, right? You need to be blind so that I can save you. And so the Pharisees say, what are we also blind, and what does Jesus say to that in response? Are the Pharisees blind? Yeah, but now that you now that you claim you can see, sin remains. The problem, the, the reality is, yes, they're blind, but they don't realize it. They're walking around like blind people, claiming that they can see, which is insanity, is ridiculous. But that's what they're doing, right? They're walking around thinking that they see, that they understand, that they've got it all figured out. And Jesus says, no, if you were blind, that would be better. If you would admit that you're blind, you would come to me. I'd forgive you. You'd have eternal life. But as long as you're walking around here as a blind person claiming that you're able to see, you're trapped in your sin. You're stuck in your sin because you're not trusting in me. Right? Oh, yeah, we already did that blindness thing. But again, St. Augustine says some of the Pharisees were disturbed by these words and said are we also blind jesus said to them because that you say that you see you're not looking for a position and that is why you will remain in your blindness if you were if you realized you were blind you'd come looking for a doctor who could heal your blindness and you would find me and i would open your eyes and you would see but in, as long as you keep wandering around thinking that you can see you're actually blind and you just don't know it that makes sense? So Jesus comes to open the eyes of the blind people and to show the people who think that they can see that they're really actually blind so that he can open their eyes. Right? Is that making sense? Okay. And that's the end of the chapter. We made it through a whole chapter in one Bible. Wow. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, with your hand you formed people in the very beginning, and with your hand you healed the eyes of the man born blind. We pray that you would open our eyes too, not just our physical eyes, but our eyes of faith to know and to believe and to trust in you, to recognize our own blindness and to rejoice in the sight that you give us as we see our own sin and your forgiveness there for us on the cross each and every day. 
Uh, we thank you for our time studying your word together. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.